Adrian, my boy, beware the call to arms. War is hell and never forget it. Violence begets violence. There is nothing for you on the field of battle but suffering and death. Adrian, my son, you've returned from Univoo. It was everything you told me, father. Everything you told me and more. I can't wait to do it again. Do you want to serve your country? How about someone else's? Why not ours? This is the army. Just four years service can completely change your life. Do you want to start a new life with your best friend on a 500,000 acre hunting estate in the marshes of Poland? Do you want to avoid capture by Italian fascists when disguising yourself as a peasant? You'll hardly recognize yourself with your newfound confidence and skills, unless you have an opinion about keeping your arms, legs, face, mental health, your very life, and maybe your immortal soul. In which case you need Babbel. Yes, Babbel's 10-minute interactive language learning lessons will have you speaking in just three weeks. You'll learn with lessons designed by real language teachers, games, podcasts, and much more in less time than it takes to finish boot camp. You will have the skills and confidence to travel the world and make friends who you'll see at a charming local coffee shop and not in your nightmares. Babbel has a few different subscriptions to choose from, including a lifetime subscription. If you're interested in learning a language, this is a great opportunity to try it out. Click on the link in the description or scan the QR to get 60% off Babbel today. And if you're not completely satisfied, Babbel offers a 20-day money-back guarantee. Babbel. Dulce et decorum est. Mr. Carton de Viart is probably one of the biggest mad lads to ever walk this earth, which has cemented his place in pop history. He was born to an aristocratic family in Brussels, but one apocryphal tale says he was a dark prince, the illegitimate son of King Leopold II, a backstory which would make him a good 10% cooler if it weren't for all the slavery and genocide that Leopold did. Adrian grew up living the kind of privileged life most people in his day could only dream of. He studied at an elite British boarding school and went to Oxford University. The man had the opportunity to become anything he wanted, and he chose to drop out and become a soldier. To each his own. Adrian was shipped out to South Africa to fight in the Second Boer War, which longtime viewers may recognize put him in direct opposition to another boots on the ground mad lad, Fritz Duquesne, otherwise known as the spy who escaped prison, smuggled himself into America, became best friends with the president, nearly convinced Congress to start a hippo farm in Louisiana, and left behind about $40 billion worth of buried treasure. Anyway, Adrian comes home with serious injuries to his stomach and groin, but for whatever reason he is in love with the military. Probably because when he wasn't at war, he had enough money and free time to play polo and schmooze his way around Europe. But don't let that mislead you. Yes, he was aristocrating it up, fox hunting in England and courting his future wife, Countess Friedrika Maria Caroline Henrietta Rosa Sabina Francisca Fugger von Babenhausen, eldest daughter of Karl V I von Fugger Babenhausen and Princess Eleonora zu Hohenholle Bartenstein und Jagstberg und Klagenfurt. But in kind of the same way an athlete might train for a marathon, Adrian was staying fit, training for war. When at long last World War I finally kicks off, Adrian is already en route to Somaliland to go kick in some teeth and uh, ends up getting shot in the face twice. It's noteworthy that this man's claim to fame is all the times he got shot without dying. I, I wonder if the British strategy was just, Duryat, are you ready to be a hero? Yes, sir. Great. You're the tank of the party. We need you to go out there and draw aggro so we can shoot the Somalis while they're busy shooting you. I wonder this because in 1915, they moved him to the Western Front with one eyeball and missing half an ear, and no one's writing home about this guy's skills as an infantry battalion leader. Although I have to say, I would have been terrified if I were put in his battalion. He specifically requested that he and his men be put into the most dangerous situations possible. In the course of the First World War, Adrian Carton de Viart was shot through the ankle at the Battle of the Somme, shot through the skull in the same battle, continued serving to be shot in the hip, shot in the ear again, lost his left hand, and when the doctor refused to amputate, he ripped off his own fingers. When asked years later what it was like to serve in the most hellish war ever fought up to that point, he replied, frankly, I had enjoyed the war. 
One thing that often gets downplayed in the light of all that carnage, and I think deserves more respect, rather than pop back to Britain to live it up in the Roaring Twenties, Adrian took a post as second-in-command of Britain's mission to support the newly formed Polish Republic. Poland, as you might know, was basically resurrected from the grave after World War I, but a lot of its neighbors were ready with shovels to send it back. Adrian fought the Bolsheviks, the Ukrainians, the Lithuanians, the Czechs, all while sending messages to the British Prime Minister that read, Dear Mr. Prime Minister, in order to further our mission, might I request that the UK do something about this war? which the Prime Minister replied, To the esteemed Mr. Carton de Wyatt, thank you for your report on the threats to our mission to Poland. Please tell the Poles to eat my shorts. Honestly, it's a small miracle Poland made it in one piece to 1939, but then, well, Germany gave power to a man with a toothbrush stash and about 70% of a Karen haircut who makes friends with the Soviets just long enough to wipe Poland off the map. Britain declares war in response, and Adrian, living in Poland as an enemy of both the Germans and the Soviets, now finds himself in quite a predicament. Adrian's job originally was to advise Polish high command, but Poland was quickly down for the count. The Soviets overran the estate he'd called home for the last two decades, and Adrian flees the country headed south. The Luftwaffe attack his convoy while the battle lines are closing in from either side, but he manages to cross the border into Romania, and from there, he hitches a plane ride with a fake passport. He was then given the rank of acting major general and led a force to retake the city of Trondheim, but ended up stuck in the snow surrounded by Nazis because the British refused to withdraw for political reasons. Then when the army finally got around to pulling him out of there, he was going to be moved to Northern Ireland to defend against the possible invasion, but Northern Ireland's new commander-in-chief decreed that at 60 years of age, Adrian was too old to be leading active duty troops. Instead, he would be sent on diplomatic mission to meet with the Yugoslavia Slavian government and negotiate terms for an alliance in the likely event Hitler invades the country. Bah! It's no fun at all. Well, it could be worse, at least. Uh oh. Uh oh? The left engine's failed. We'll have to start a descent and reroute to the nearest. I hope you read your handbook! Believe it or not, not the first time Adrian survived a plane crash. They splashed down off the coast of Italian Libya. The Italian army was waiting for them when they came to shore and hauled them off to prison. Adrian was put in a special POW camp for high-ranking officers in an old castle. I'm sure it was dire straits, but hell, if the trenches were peachy, you'd think this would be like summer camp. He made five different escape attempts, and once managed to break out of the fortress after seven months of digging. He disguised himself as a peasant in northern Italy, but was quickly identified as the only 61-year-old with an eye patch and a missing arm who couldn't speak Italian. Good evening, Mr. Deviart. Where are we? You have been transferred to a very special facility in Rome. We are here to ask you some questions. If you're not here to negotiate your surrender, I've got nothing to say to you. <laughs> Is that so? Then perhaps you will help us negotiate our surrender? In a stunning turn of events, yes, Italy was secretly preparing to exit the war in 1943, and Adrian was flown off with an Italian negotiator to Lisbon, Portugal, where they had a nice talk with the British, and then Adrian was flown back to Britain as a free man. Score! Then, within a month, he got another unexpected transfer. Winston Churchill noticed that the last time he heard anything about Adrian, he was crashing into the sea, and two years later, he was negotiating Italy doing, well, what Italy does in world wars. So Churchill sends de Wiert to be his personal representative in China. Much like Poland, Adrian found a new home in China and developed a love for the country and its citizens, once lifted of his preconception of, quote, a whimsical little people with quaint customs who carved lovely jade ornaments and worshipped their grandmothers. He did a lot of basic reporting back to Britain, nothing as crazy as crashing a plane, escaping a POW camp, or getting shot through the skull. Damn war heroes living long, boring lives instead of dying in a blaze of glory. He must have gotten close, though. The Chinese government in the 40s didn't last long what with Mao Zedong's impending communist takeover and all, and when Adrian met Mao at a dinner one time, he got up to interrupt the great leader's speech to accost him for his actions during the war. Mao was in a good enough mood and Adrian was British enough that the great leader laughed it off, but part of me wonders if Adrian was hoping to cross fistfight with a dictator off his bucket list. He continued his work in China for a few years, traveling through Southeast Asia as well, until he made the decision to retire in 1947. And on his way back home to Britain, he slipped on some stairs, broke several bones, and fell unconscious, but didn't die. He lived until 1963 and spent more than a decade in retirement with his second wife.